we're running these webinars because really partly because of the lockdown and um, because we've missed you and we haven't had much opportunity to uh, invite you to the sessions that we normally run during the year to um, put you in touch with some of the world leading experts that we have in the UK uh, uh, that deal in all aspects of macular disease. Uh, and we know how much people do value actually being able to talk directly to some of the most senior researchers and clinicians uh, in the world. And that's why we're doing this tonight. Although we've understood that actually they're more important in, in the days of coronavirus. And also because they're so well attended and well supported, actually, I think it's something that we're going to do even when this horrible virus is behind us. Great news today about the potential for a vaccine, which is marvellous news. So I am very grateful to all the uh, experts who have uh, joined me on these sessions so far and who are going to give their time uh, to be with you uh, uh, on evenings like this. So um, as I say, we are recording this meeting. Uh, so if you know of people who can't be here tonight or you're not able to stay for any reason, there will be opportunities to look at it again uh, from our website. Uh, at the end of it, you'll be uh, in a day or two, you'll be sent a questionnaire and we'd be really grateful to get your feedback because that will help us improve these events and make sure that they're as good as they possibly can be. So our guest tonight is uh, Mr. Declan Flanagan. Now, he is a consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, where he is also the deputy, uh, medical, the deputy director of research, and he's also a vice president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So you can see that uh, he's very eminent indeed. He also chairs the committee that oversees the work of the CVI office, that is to say, the uh, Certificate of Visual Impairment. And we've asked Declan to come this evening to talk specifically about that. So also with us uh, tonight is Colin Daniels, who is our manager of our Working Age and Young People's Services. And I've asked him to come along because um, he has personal experience of the CVI, but has also uh, uh, knows a great deal about the, sp the specific benefits uh, to visually impaired people of the CVI system. So if you have specific questions about that, then Colin is here on hand to answer that question. But now I'm going to hand over to Declan uh, and I have some slides. I'm going to share my screen so that uh, Declan, you can uh, speak away and I will share my screen with the slides when you're ready to, uh, uh, to crack on with them. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, Declan. Well, thank you, Cathy, for that generous introduction. No, everybody likes being called, being, called, being called a world authority. Thank you for that. I'm also grateful that um, Colin is here to compliment my talk and handle the details that I am a little unclear on. So on that note, I'll start and I shall stick strictly to time and aim to finish in half an hour because I can't hold an audience for longer than that. So this is me, uh, Declan Planning and Vice President of the College previously medical director of Moorfields, and I worked in Addenbrooke before that, so I've been in various places. Next slide, please. Next slide. My current role as deputy director of research in Moorfields has allowed me and given me the responsibility for ensuring the smooth running of the CVI registration office, which is based in Moorfields Eye Hospital, funded by the Department of Health directly, uh, which is quite important, and also overseen for quality assurance purposes by a, a, the CVI committee, which is in the role of College Ophthalmologists. So just to roll back a bit with the history of public health recording of visual impairment in the UK, in the, there has been a record of visual impairment held centrally in the UK since 1851, when it was first added to the census data. And that ran from 1851 to 1911, when we had, we got Churchill's Pensions Act and a lot of other things uh, that led on. And also we understand some benefits from uh, being registered as visually impaired. In 1920, had a, a more formalization of things with the Blind Persons Act. So you had a formal register of individuals with sight loss. There were significant, certain benefits from local authorities. And for the first time, you had to be registered as, as visually impaired by a medical doctor. This developed further, and by 1935, approximately, you had a form called the BD-8 introduced, which had to be signed by an ophthalmologist, and later specifically by a consultant. In 1948, you got the NHS and the National Assistant Act, 
which formalized the process and also defined the visual impairment as being unable to do any useful work. That was the definition, which I feel is slightly um, significantly antiquated, but there we are. Uh, in 2013, you had the public health outcomes framework, which for the first time made it and may obliged the Department of Health to ensure that there were published indicators of high quality demonstrating preventable visual loss on their website. And that is updated every year. And it's based on the CBI data from the year before. So this is why the Department of Health funds the Certificate Office so they can produce the high quality evidence of visual impairment that they, are, that they have a statutory obligation to provide. And they do this for not just ophthalmology, but a whole range of other conditions as well. The only downside is it's buried in the, buried in the Public Health Outcomes Framework website, which can be quite hard to find. Finally, we had all this cemented in the, health and the, social, the 2014 Health and Social Care Act, which, as you know, revamped the way healthcare is provided uh, for better or worse. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, so the, the, um, the, we've had data collected from 1851 of quite high quality. It's done to proper statistical standards right from the very beginning, and it's fully, it's fully anonymized. Once the data is checked and cal 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 calibrated and collated, once we press the button, the, we, we, it's completely anonymized. We cannot get the names back. So it is, and that is a reassurance, and it's a, it's a statistical Thing people insist on. It's worth remembering there are other, the, the uh, eyes was one of the first uh, significant things to be recorded, but there were others. Maternal mortality data only dates from 1837, which prior to that we just relied on parish registers. And cholera outbreaks and the ghastly deaths that followed were really only formally organized and reported in reports dating from 1848. So visual impairment was noticed was recognized early on by Victorian society to be a big problem and, and, and potentially amenable to treatment and, and that people could be helped by it. Uh, so the, this information has been used to offer benefits and help to visually impaired people from the very beginning, uh, first with the Victorian charities and more, and more recently the much more organized system. It's been used to improve care by identifying variation in the rates of blindness and in the provision of, 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 of help and also service weaknesses. It also guides investment in services and research. So that's what the central database does. And it is in many ways a forerunner of the highly sophisticated databases such as Biobank and in the last two years, Insights UK provide, where vast amounts of data uh, are collated, uh, anonymized, and then used to used to predict and understand better the causes of visual loss and hopefully uh, guide um, methods of improving, sorry, reversing or preventing this visual loss. So the CVI is the, it was the earliest in a, a long tradition of using uh, properly collected and anonymized databases to help healthcare. Next, please. This is just for something to diverge slightly. This is the slide demonstrating that all through the 19th century, the rate of the maternal mortality rate in, in the UK was 500 per 100,000 in 1850, and it continued at much that level to, 19, to about 1900 when it started to slowly drop. Prior to 18, 18, 1850, you really only had parish records, which varied a lot. From 1870, you had reliable records. Uh, because the death certificates became a, became, uh, a legal requirement. Uh, so I, just for reassurance, the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 has dropped to 10 in, in 1980, and is about half that now. The big drop, in, in, just to diverge slightly, the big drop in maternal mortality rates was started in 1930, and you'll see the graph there, and that, that, was, that was a sulfonamide antibiotics which prevented infection after birth. And it's interesting that that drug was, was invented and, and manufactured by Bayer, who, as you know, more recently have made a significant contribution to ophthalmology when they developed um, the drug Ilea. So 
some uh, these are the benefits of a lot of large drug companies next please so to switch back to ophthalmology this is data over over 10 years almost on the rates of visual impair visual impairment and you can see the major one is over 9000 pe people a year registered visually impaired from age related macular degeneration which is the top one glaucoma about 2000 a year which is stable uh, and then you have diabetic eye, diabetic eye disease which has dropped dramatically in 10 years and interestingly the blue one near the end demonstrates a slow but statistically significant rise of visual handicap from uh, visual impairment from hereditary eye disease uh, which is being it's been recognized more recently but it, it it undoubtedly overlaps with macular degeneration associated with increasing age and the more we understand about inherited eye disease, the more likely we are to find, to understand the pathology of the disease and apply, and apply that knowledge to develop cures for all forms of macular degeneration affecting older or younger people. So that's where we are at the moment. You'll notice age related macular degeneration is slowly dropping, but not dropping fast enough. If we could switch to the next slide, please. This is a more positive slide, but it shows that in 2011, 131 people per 100,000 over the age of 65 were registered as visually impaired uh, from age-related macular degeneration. By 2018, this number had dropped quite substantially to 106 per 100,000, and it's probably stayed at much that level since. Uh, and it may be that it'll be difficult to get it much lower until we find an effective cure, 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 cure for geographic atrophy or dry age-related macular degeneration. So this is all this is attributable to Avastin, Lucentis, and ILEA uh, over the past um, eight or nine years at enormous cost in patients' time, monthly visits for forever, uh, significant inconvenience and travel costs, and uh, a, a large number of staff and expensive drugs. But it has got somewhere, and I'm grateful to all those who have contributed to this. Next, please. Next one. Next slide, oh, go very good. That's it. Now this just demonstrates that the age stratification, you will notice, and uh, other people have, have shown this before, that under the age of 60 to 69, there really is only small numbers of, of unfortunate people registered visually impaired from macular degeneration. Uh, you'll see it's about 3% of registrations from macular degeneration are under the age of 70. And it's really only until it gets to 75 plus that the number that the, the numbers per year in England and Wales starts to rise dramatically. 500 under 500 per 500 a, a year in total in the UK in England and Wales, uh, and on the, in the 70 74 age group. But by the 75 79, it's more than doubled, and it doubles again every five years uh, over the over, until over 90. So that's just to put it in context. And it's interesting that the, the average age of patients in the landmark trials that demonstrated that, that Lucentis works were age 77, which fits in with this graph. Uh, this has been known by many people for years, but it is, it's important to see it in context. And this data could only have been found out from the UK's robust, uh, carefully collated and high quality uh, CVI data that we collect all the time. Uh, the CVI system <coughs> in the UK is one of the best in the world. Very few other countries have quite such a centralized, comprehensive, wide-ranging impair visual impairment registration system as the UK has. Holland and I think uh, Scandinavia have similar high-quality systems, but most other countries run it on a regional basis with varying quality. Uh, there are similar systems in Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, to the CVI in England and Wales. Next, please. So the median age of certification is 86, which is rising year on year. Uh, the small numbers under 70. Approximately half of the registrations are from are from neovascular age-related macular degeneration, and the other half from geographic atrophy dry. There are a significant number of people who have elements of both. Uh, diagnosis of 
macular degeneration at a younger age may well reflect a genetic cause and, and needs further research. There's a major need for better imaging of how we describe and see and identify macular degeneration. There's a great need for better methods of measuring visual function. The, the time honored selling chart and indeed ETDRS systems are useful, but they don't really tell us what it's like from the patient's perspective to have visual impairment. And we urgently need a bet, better systems for that. And we also need better long-term natural history and treatment studies to understand better which patients get worse and, and in what time scale. The next slide here shows that whether you're gi giving a patient a drug like Lucentis or Lyle or, or Avastin, or you want to deliver gene therapy or stem cells, the methods of delivery are very similar in that you, need, you could deliver it into the vitreous or else you work further and deliver it under the retina, as in the slide on the left. There are about 300 currently identified retinal genetic disorders with a, with a, with a, with a genotype described. Uh, some of these genes will influence the development of macular degeneration, wet and dry. There's only one licensed treatment for macular degeneration so far, Luxterna, but, the, but there, are, uh, there are a whole series of drugs in trials at the moment, which show significant promise. And uh, the UK is, in, is, leading, uh, is leading in many areas of, the, of this research. And this research, I can reassure you, has continued despite COVID. And we, we Morphos in particular, in Manchester as well, did, and Oxford, did restart their gene therapy trials for macular degeneration as early as July in the first wave of reopening. Next, please. That's it. This slide uh, demonstrates that in, in Morphos in particular and the rest of the country is not dissimilar. A lot of patients stopped coming for their injections, uh, as you can see here in month three and four. That's the green column. Uh, it dropped substantially in, in March and then also and much more in April. And the number of patients coming for their first injection, probably the most important injection, remained very low at only a third of what it was before in April, May, with a slight rise in June and a slow but steady rise since then. Though we're still not up, our injection rates in Morphids are still not up to what they were uh, in, in, the, in, in, in October 2019 and October 2018. They're the blue and the red columns respectively. So there's a bit to go and I do hope that with the second wave, patients do keep coming in for their injections because those early injections for these drugs are vitally important. It can be very difficult to pull it back if you lose it because the early injection is delayed. So that's, there are a whole range of patients who we hope haven't lost too much vision as a result of missing injections. Uh, and we now, we, we would want to reassure people that we are making our hospitals as safe as possible for this. Uh, and we're we're working very hard to allow as many patients as possible to be followed up in optometry shops, which are inherently safer and more accessible. So next slide, please. This shows the rates of certification of visual impairment in the COVID pandemic. And you can see that it, in, a, in April, the number of certifications of newly registered people visually impaired had dropped from 2000 a month in March to 600 a month in April, and it dropped even lower in, in May and June. The four started to come back very quickly in July, August, September, October, and we're getting close to what it should be now. But there is still a big, a big group of patients who will not have been registered visually impaired who should have been. And we're, we're reminding all ophthalmologists to make every effort to identify this group we won't know probably for a couple of years whether how many patients have actually lost vision as a result of delays in treatment uh, due to COVID, but hopefully it won't be as many as we think. So that um, shows the drop in certification due to the COVID pandemic and the recent rapid recovery. Uh, and we, next please, when you're ready. This is, uh, a new, a new development which 
has been emphasized and probably accelerated and brought forward by as a result of the COVID crisis. Community diagnostic hubs. These are an attempt to get away from crowded, risky uh, uh, out hospital clinics with patients at risk of transmitting COVID. The idea here is that you have a properly designed five or six lane uh, uh, facility developed specifically to see patients on time uh, and then leave on time. And then the images are reviewed, the photographs, the OCTs are reviewed by doctors or nurses or optometrists remotely, and you get a result the next, next day. And this allows maximum social distancing, minimal patient and staff contact, and uh, all these clinics will remain open in the second wave, if at all possible. Other hospitals in the UK, this is a Morphin's one, in fact, but other hospitals in the UK are doing the same and redesign their outpatient services to be able to see patients uh, in a safer fashion. And I would stress the need to avail of these facilities, particularly with, with, for AMD. Uh, next, please. The Morphin's is fortunate in that the um, research facility is adjacent to the diagnostic hub. And we hope to use this as this opportunity to increase the number of patients who are offered the chance to get involved in clinical trials by stepping around from the diagnostic clinic straight into the research facility. And other units are doing much the same. Next, please. This is again, it's an NHS priority to make eye care more accessible and less hospital dependent and safer. These are three large trials which are being run nationally at the moment. They're led by Morphus, but they are national multi-center trials. Phenetra, Hermes, and Athena, uh, uh, two gods and a window. Uh, the Phenetra study is designed to demonstrate that once you've had your AMD treatment with 10 or 12 or 15 injections and, and you're stable, that you don't have to come back to hospital, that you can be safely reviewed by OCT, by a local optometrist. Uh, and this trial started in 2019, I'll go, and I'll tell you what happened that after that. Hermes is a telemedicine. It's designed to demonstrate that if you, if, a, if you go to an optometrist shop and they do an OCT, they will be able to transmit that to an eye doctor, or, and they will be able to say whether you need to be seen promptly or, or they reassure you that you don't need to be seen. And this, this again, is starting as we speak. And finally, there's Athena, which is designed to uh, minimize the need for flourishing angiography to decide whether you need to have Lucentis or Alia or Avastin. And that is, has been approved and funded and is due to start in early 2021. Athena involves 1,000 patients, Hermes involves 500 patients, and Phenage involves 700 plus patients. So these are big studies that need to be run nationally and uh, need to be run properly for to get the um, benefit out of them. They're designed to confirm the safety and efficacy of out of hospital follow up. They're essential as diagnostic hubs and optometry practice play a bigger role. We need to confirm by research that this method of follow up is safe. Over half the optometrists in the country, in, the, in, in England and Wales, now have secure links, I mean, uh, uh, data protection secure links to NHSI departments. So that means one can safely transmit information from optometry practice to hospitals and back again. And these three studies, as I said, are coordinated by Moorfields. These three studies, for what it's worth, each, each cost uh, over a million pounds because they need to follow large numbers of patients in an effective way for a couple of years. So uh, if you wish to be involved in these trials, please talk to your local ophthalmologist who may well be able to, who may well be running the, a, a trial locally near you. We cannot collect such numbers relying purely on one hospital. And most of the big eyes of the country are involved in this. And other studies, other similar studies. Next, please. Uh, so this is for nature in detail. There's the research question. Is follow-up of treated AMD by optometry with OCT safe? Patients are randomized, one, one to the hospital, one to community care. We have 742 of them. A quarter of them more the rest in 10 other sites. Recruitment uh, will end in August 2021. We need to recruit 70 patients a month. 
that's managed to catch up on the COVID pause. And anybody in this trial will be have an OCT monthly by an optometrist for a year to check that it this that this is a safe method of following up patients who have stable treated macular degeneration. Bear in mind, the country de delivers about 400,000 AMD injections a year. That means there are a very large number of patients who have stable treated disease who really can't keep coming up to hospital, just isn't room. And we need an easier, more accessible, safe way of, of uh, monitoring them. So I'd, um, if you do wish to be involved in this trial, it is likely to, it, to benefit you and others by confirming that you don't need to be seen in hospital regularly. Next, please. This was the pilot, the pilot scheme started in October in Wolfers, Bristol, Manchester, Leeds, York, and Bradford. The second wave was due to start in early March, which is not a good time to start a clinical trial in, in England, as you can imagine. We're in a whole range of other hospitals. We've also now added Wales to this study, and there will be a number of hospitals in Wales that will be doing it too. Uh, next, please. This demonstrates the effect of COVID on the FNAS route trial. You can see we got going with the with the pilot in August. In August, in, it's in about October in 2019. We were all set to go in the first week of March. After recruiting about two patients in March, early March, we had to stop under instructions from NHS England and the National Institute of Health Research. So we had no patients recruited in March, April, May, and Ju June, July. Um, we restarted uh, recruiting patients again in August, which was early, and we've, we've kept that up. But it's important we maintain it. We're extending it to other sites to make sure we, get the, we catch up and get the patients we need for statistical significance. We need to make up lost time due to COVID. And if you would like to be involved, it may be worth um, emailing the, the address at the bottom. So that's Fenetra. Next, please. Next slide, please. Oh. So this is my last slide. Uh, so in summary, the certificate of visual impairment was one of the very early public health indicators dating back to the middle of the last of the century before last. Uh, it offers timely help to, it's, its purpose is designed to offer timely help to patients and also provide data to guide allocation of resources and research. And it's done this pretty well for 170 years. Uh, I've discussed the impact of the COVID pandemic on AMD treatment and I've made reference to the need, the need for ongoing research, not just to discover new treatments, but just as importantly at the moment, to find better ways of delivering the treatment we've got to patients uh, in an accessible, convenient fashion using um, out-of-hospital systems and imaging. Thank you all. Declan, thank you very much indeed. That was extremely interesting. We'll get on to some questions. Um, I'm just going to, um, I'm sorry about the slides were a bit jerky. I think there was a bit of a delay on the, on the line. I'm uh, working from home this evening um, rather than the office because of lockdown. And I think my home uh, broadband is perhaps not quite as good as the office. So uh, sorry for the delays on that. Um, a, a question that came in actually while you were speaking, which isn't specifically about CVI, but is about COVID. Um, and I think you mentioned and encouraged people to come uh, and have their COVID, um, uh, have, their, have their injections, not be worried about COVID. But this question was actually, do we know for sure that nobody has caught COVID from coming to the eye clinic? It must be, it is, we know it is in people's minds. Well, the short answer is we, we don't know that nobody has contacted us from visiting an eye clinic. Um, what we do know is that the numbers are extreme, must be extremely small, we, because I think we would know about it if it wasn't. The next point is that I think it's important to stress that we do recognize that transmission of COVID from, from healthcare, healthcare workers to healthcare workers and to patients and back again is an inherent risk. And certainly all, most hospitals are making enormous efforts to spread out patients and staff, to shorten the visits, 
and to protect staff and patients as much as possible using all the usual precautions. Also, practically everybody who's anywhere near a patient in hospital at the moment is having is having is being tested for COVID-19 weekly. Um, and there are a number of large trials running which demonstrate that the number of hospital staff infected with COVID at any given time is very low and probably about 3%. There are, we've had run, we're running a trial in Moffitt at the moment, which demonstrates that it's about three, in a large number of Moffitt's patients, Moffitt's staff have, who are tested fortnightly and will be for a year and also have antibody tests. Uh, we've only had three staff in 300 and something who've been, who've been swabbed repeatedly over the past four months. So the numbers of staff infected with COVID are not zero, but they are very small. And most importantly, hospitals are making every effort to minimize that risk as much as possible. It's also important to realize that this data on hospital infection rates in, with COVID, symptomatic or asymptomatic, will form the baseline against which the effects of vaccines, beneficial effects of vaccines, will be judged. Uh, so I, I, if that bring, gives some reassurance to people that um, nobody has caught COVID, that very few of you have caught COVID in hospital. Okay, thank you very much. So just some questions specifically about CVI then. So um, uh, a question about the kinds of conditions that qualify for CVI. So what, 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 how, do you, how do you get a CVI? When do you get one? And are conditions such as um, central retinal vein occlusion, uh, are they the kind of conditions that would also fall into the CVI qualification? Yes, it's the, the question of whether uh, you will be offered uh, certification registration and whether you will benefit from it is based completely on your level of vision and not on uh, the disease condition. It's your level of visual impairment and not on the disease condition. So whether you've got a vein occlusion, uh, an inherited retinal dystrophy, um, uh, uh, injuries, or um, macular degeneration is irrelevant. It's judged on whether whether you are so impaired as uh, that is, is significantly affecting your life. That is the judgment made by the the doctor or nurse or whoever is discussing it in conjunction with the patient or their family. Uh, in general terms, you will be registered as severely sight impaired if you if your vision is less is less than 360, which is the ability to see the top letter on a Snellen chart at not six meters, but three meters. Uh, you, will, you can also be registered as severely visually impaired if you have a lot of very severe visual constriction, tunnel vision of 10 or five, five or 10 degrees, which can, which can be just as, rate as, as limiting on lifestyle. That's for severely visually impaired. For sight impaired, uh, the definition is slightly more, uh, less closely defined. It's based on an overall assessment of how much impact the, the level of visual impairment is having on that particular patient in conjunction with the patient. And I think something less than 6, 618, 624, which is three or four, three lines on the chart is normally regarded as uh, the cutoff for, uh, for um, sight impairment. But, but other facts may come into account. If your vision is 618 or 612 and you have a lot of visual, hand, visual field impairment, you might well qualify uh, for, a, for a, to, be, to be sight impaired. Bear in mind, certification or registration is offered. Some patients feel they, feel they don't want it at that time, but they can always return if they decide that they would like to be registered later. So it's very much a voluntary thing but most patients who are offered it do tend to take it up as there are significant benefits. We'll, we'll come on to those in, in a minute, but clearly this, uh, um, this um, uh, moment of registration, this, this, this boundary, if you like, uh, can be a bit flexible. So uh, we have a, a question that's talked about her mother who said her mother um, can't see to read, she can't use cutlery, she can't cut her own fingernails. Um, but she can read a few letters on the third row of the chart, and so has been told that she doesn't qualify. So there's a, a degree of, um, uh, of uh, subjectivity about this, is there, in the, in the registration process. If she went somewhere else, somebody may say, potentially, yes, you are registrable. That is, that is I have to say, correct. 
it's very difficult to draw a line because I, you, there's a gray area of which side of the line are you on. And um, however, there has to be some kind of guidance to ensure some kind of consistency and to give the system validity and credibility. Um, and and that, that, has al that will always be an issue because we don't know, and I think I referred to this, we don't know exactly how visually impaired a person is. Only they know that. Uh, the, the person measuring their vision, in, as well as we can, can have a fair idea, but they don't ultimately know how badly affected and how severely the impairment is, is impacting on that particular individual's life and lifestyle. So I think that's, that gives, that gives, attempt to give some context to it. Um, it, would it be worth somebody who, because there are benefits, I'll ask Colin, I'll come to Colin in, in a second, but because there are benefits ab about this, what, um, would, what would you advise somebody to go back and say, look, actually, I think my mother is right on the cusp of this. So, um, you know, could you please think about this again? Because there are significant benefits to her being registered. And, you know, we, we, we think this is arguable. We'd like to take issue with the, with the decision. Can you do that? Yes, I, you, yes, you can do that. And I mean, I've had people write to me over the years making that point politely and I have um, in some cases revised my decision or thought about it a bit more or they got worse in the meantime. So I think one needs to be fle flexible about it. On the other hand, one does have an element of common sense about it too. I've had people in the past write to me quite vociferously saying, I would like to be registered as partially sighted. Why? Because I've got one eye. And that I can see the logic where they're coming from, but actually if you're six four in, in one eye with a full visual field, you don't really qualify. You don't qualify as sight impaired. And I think most people in the room would, would agree with that statement. It is a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? If somebody's lost an eye, it does feel a bit counterintuitive. Even, even though losing one eye does impact on what you're doing, there are a whole range of occupations you can't do. You have to be, most people are rather more careful when you've got one eye. And you do lose visual field and there, your, your space, your ability to play ball games and lots of other things is lost. So it's, it, is a, it is an impairment, but it doesn't qualify. And ultimately, I, in most countries, it doesn't really qualify as a visual impairment, as, a, as, as likely to benefit from significant um, assistance. So I think you, you mentioned that it's a voluntary system. Obviously, it is a voluntary system. Uh, and some people choose not to be um, uh, certified or, or subsequently registered because the registration as visual impairment is done by the local authority, isn't it? Uh, subsequent to a certificate being issued of permanent and irreversible visual impairment. So it's a two-stage process, isn't it? And then it's the, the benefits that then accrue from uh, certification are actually from the at the point of registration, as I understand it, is that... That's right, I think, isn't it? That once you're registered, you qualify for the benefits. Now, some people don't want to do, want to be uh, certified or re registered. Um, is that because there's still some actual stigma and taboo attached to this, do you think? It's, it's hard to say, but I, I think, yes, some people value, some people take a, quite a while to come, to come round to, the idea that they are vi visually impaired and a lot of some people do refuse it initially but on reflection they do come back up to a year or two later say they thought about it and they would now like to avail of the benefits so it, it's not a one-off thing i think we need to stress to patients you don't have to rush into this we re if you if you want would like to think about it or revise your views or discuss with people we're happy to 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 do it later that's the line I've always taken, which appears to be reasonably successful. But there are some people who, for whatever reason, they decide it's not for them. And sometimes I can see that they are, they are depriving themselves of some help, which I blatantly know they would benefit from. And one has to spend some time talking around the subject, uh, letting, them, letting them draw their own conclusions, but draw their own conclusions based on the evidence available. Uh, and the opportunity to consider that evidence. And a lot of people do come around to seeing the benefits after that. Okay, let me come to Colin then. Colin, if you could um, just summarize for us, what, what are the benefits of being um, registered? What, 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 what's, what good does it do people? The most important thing that it does 
um, is it protects people under law um, as having a disability. So um, the Equality Act 2010 uh, works on um, my, we've got a video on or not? Um, yeah, you have, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the Equality Act 2010 um, has things called protected characteristics and one of them is, is being disabled. Um, so it means that if a service is offered to you or a service is withdrawn from you because of your disability, um, then that person is then breaking the law, that company, that organisation is breaking the law. Um, so that's the most important thing to think about when you're, when you're considering reg registration. However, on top of that, there are some actual statutory benefits um, and some other entitlements that a, a, a certification will support you with. Um, now, most people um, think that, uh, that being registered as severely sight impaired, blind, um, and the stigma attached to that um, is, is devastating. Um, and no, and no uh, amount of entitlement or statutory entitlement is going to bring that back. But it does help to make life just a little bit easier. Um, so there are more automatic entitlements as someone is registered as severely sight impaired. Uh, and, and, and the main ones are um, if you're a little younger than pension age uh, entitlement to a, a, a free bus pass, um, the, an eligibility to apply for a disabled person's rail card. Now that's not free, that's £20 for a year uh, or £50 for three years, but it tends to pay for itself quite quickly because train fares are expensive. Um, and that gives you a third off travel and your companion, and one companion with you, a third off travel on, on trains. Um, registration in Scotland will get you a free uh, transport uh, pass. Basically, you can travel on uh, buses, trains and ferries and, and go up to bridges for free, I think. Um, unfortunately, no, no air flights, so you have to stay within Scotland, I'm afraid, but you know, there you go. Um, the, uh, and the, the other things that you're, you're entitled to, uh, a half price TV license, um, which is a bit bizarre if you're registered as severely sight impaired. But um, going back to what uh, uh, Declan was talking about a wee while ago, um, one of the things that used to get back in the day when there were such things as radio licenses, as uh, people that were registered under a BD8 as blind got, um, got a free radio license, uh, which was the equivalent of £2.48 in new, in new money. Um, so that, yeah, there's a bit of <laughs> irrelevant information that I store this stuff, sorry. Um, and then the, uh, the, the most important thing uh, for somebody who is registered as severely sight impaired uh, is an extra t money on your tax float. Uh, so for, for your PAYE code, so if you're still working, or even if you're not, um, your, your, uh, in, your personal tax code for most people is about £12,000 at the moment, but with a blind person's tax allowance, we'll take that up to uh, 14, 1450 quid that you could, uh, 14,050 quid. Uh, before you can. Um, um, now, the good thing about the uh, the tax code, that additional tax, is that if if you, as a person who's registered severely sight impaired, and your your spouse, so you're either your civil partner or your spouse, you actually have to be married, um, it is working, and you're not, you can pass that on to them, which is quite a convenient thing to do. Um, and for older people, if you are registered as severely sight impaired. And you might have a pension or some investments that you pay tax on. So you're paying a little bit of tax. If you claim for that tax, that might actually take you out of tax. And the way that you do a claim for all of these things is by using the certificate of visual impairment. So you 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 will get uh, issued with a certificate of visual impairment, which is a an A4 sheet of paper, um, sort of with a, with a few sheets. Um, make a few photocopies and send it off to the four winds. Um, but as you mentioned, Cathy, you, you sort of get registered, your registration is completed by your uh, local, um, your, your local county council sensory support team, um, and they will support you through that and making, making all those claims um, and getting all those right and correct entitlements. Sadly, he says, um, people with, uh, who are registered as sight impaired will only get um, a, a free bus pass and entitlement to um, uh, a disabled person's rail card. Um, but in, in, in fairness, you, you do have a little bit more vision so that we have to look on the positives rather than the negatives. Um, so 
but to, oh, I forgot one, uh, which is an automatic entitlement to a, a to a blue badge per parking permit uh, for if you're registered as severely sight impaired. Um, so you can just apply for that online. Uh, it lasts for ten years, uh, three years, and it costs a tenner. Um, obviously, you can't drive as someone that can't see, but you do do get in cars, which means that you're able to use it for accessible parking. Brilliant. Colin, thank you very much indeed. That's really, really helpful. Um, just uh, coming back, uh, Declan, to some other general questions about um, the, the certification. So the question is, you, you, you pointed to the fact that the number of certifications has, has gradually, very slightly dipped down, which we think is due to the treatment now available for um, wet AMD. But this question is, are, are they really falling because of that when actually the number of people diagnosed with the condition is rising and is it just that actually not enough people are being registered and people are slipping through the net for one reason or another ophthalmologists can't be bothered <laughs> uh, is there is there a, a other people slipping through the net you're on mute by the way so let's un, un, unmute you yeah hey you're right on both counts or all three counts um However, I, I would say that we what we bear in mind we're measuring incidence of of visual impairment as measured as documented by the certification process. We're not the only way to get the real information you're talking about is to do a prevalence study, a large pre, a large statistically significant prevalence study of a representative segment of the UK population. And that would, and you, to do that, you would need to go and ask, ask and examine thousands of patients with their permission um, uh, to see what their visual status is. And based on that, you could then work out what was a more accurate level of visual impairment in the UK and compare that with the certification process. But there, there is evidence over the years that certification underreports the le level of visual impairment um, to a significant extent, uh, based on a number of sort of surrogate measures. The RNIB has done some good work on that over the years, but it, it does it does certainly underreport. There's there's more about more of it around than the figures would demonstrate. But what I would say is that um, the UK compares well with most other European countries in the quality of this data. And I think we, we we do push at ophthalmologists the need to take this re recording seriously because it does does give good data. I've certainly pushed over the past couple of years to make the information from the CVI process more widely available to ophthalmologists. Up to now, it's been a bit buried in the uh, obscure uh, websites of the of the go UK government and, and only seen by researchers, but. We have published quite a bit in the last couple of years for, aimed at ophthalmologists and optometrists, uh, explaining what the rates of visual impairment are, various subtleties, the evidence that diabetic eye disease is dropping, the evidence that AMD is two factors, three factors. One is dry, one is mixed, and one is uh, wet. And that the three interact, and it, it's, there's a paper published next week on the subject. So we are doing a lot to show ophthalmologists and optometrists the benefits of having a really accurate certification system to, to inform them in their practice and to inform where we should be putting money into research and investment. And also to identify variations in the service patients with vision impairment get in different parts of the country, because it, do, it does vary significantly for various reasons lack or except lack of our delivery of resources, interest by committed ophthalmologists and optometrists, interest by uh, some local authorities taking much more of an active interest than others. And we, we try to use exemplars as a method of encouraging the others. Um, it's also a, 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 it's also is helpful in identifying whether specific groups of hard to reach and seldom heard and seldom heard groups are are more at risk of visual impairment and more at risk of not being re registered and not getting the benefits. So that would be my response to your what you're saying. But on the other hand, there's truth in what you say. 
Do we know, do we even know what percentage of visual impairment, people with visual impairment have a CVI? Because, I mean, the other side of this is that the barrier for registration is actually quite high, isn't it? And there are, there are, there's a large population, particularly in the AMD population, who will have low vision, technically low vision. So they have vision that can't be corrected with spectacles, but which does have an impact on their daily life. But they still, they don't qualify or anywhere near qualify for, um, for, um, uh, for, for, for certification and registration. So does it, does it do enough, do you think, to capture? Do we know what percentage of visual impairment is actually registered, registrable? We, we, we don't know how many people truly sh we should be registering if we were, do get, if we were catching, catching all of them. Uh, and that's because we've never, we've never done a national survey. But the, the evidence from some studies in mainly in North America, um, where they have taken selected populations and really, really looked at every one of them in detail. I think Beaver Dam was one of them. Mm. Framingham, which is the oldest one. They did look at a, a specific town or towns in North America, put a ring fence around them, so to speak, and look at every, and try to look at every individual in that population and stratify them by age, age, sex, employment, ethnicity. And, and try and detect what is the true instance of visual impairment. And in Framingham, it was extended to all sorts of things. And those studies have run for many years and haven't have given good vision, good, good, good use information to, to guide to guide treatment. But there is there is a gap, and it's it's never been done comprehensively. And well, one of the other problems I think is that is that many many people with dry AMD. Um, because the clinics are full and there's no capacity to see them, can get lost in the system because only an ophthalmologist can uh, issue the certificate. Um, would it be a good idea if optometrists could do this? And so certification could be done in the community without a, re a referral into hospital. Do you think that would help to capture uh, more people? I think it would. And it's, it's not, the, it, there's been pressure in parts of the country for this to happen. The only place where progress has been made is in Wales, where there was a study done last year, or published last year, which demonstrated that trained optometrists were just as good and just as accurate at registering patients, at certifying patients with visual impairment from dry age-related macular degeneration. And now that, that, now that that has been proved in principle, uh, we're now actively and at the very late stage of setting up a pilot in one health, one Welsh health board to check it to see it works in practice, and it, if, if this is demonstrated in practice over like six or nine months, we would be using Wales as an exemplar to suggest that this is rolled out through, through the rest of the UK. Uh, it will improve access. It'll reduce visits to hospital. It'll speed up the process, and uh, it may then be applied to other forms of visual impairment. But now that we've proved the principle with the publication last year, we now need to run a pilot just to see how the mechanics of it works in practice. And at that point, it should be will be rolled out throughout Wales. That's the plan, and it's been coming for eight years, but I think it, it's close to fruition. It'll work in Wales because there's a particularly well-developed community optometry system, reasonably well linked to hospitals. Uh, but it, it does it does require a proper linked system so that everybody knows the patient has had has visual impairment and ensures consistency um, the, as I said in my talk a year ago only 500 optometric optometry practices in the in the UK in, in England Wales were linked up to the NHS net secure data protection system as of last month three three thousand eight hundred practices in England Wales are now linked to the NHS net secure system, and we hope to get to 6,000 in the next year or so. And this, I all give all due credit to NHS for pushing this during the COVID crisis, but this allows optometrists to communicate much more freely with hospital eye clinics and with the rest of the system in a secure way, in a way they haven't done before. And this, I think, will help, will help mean that more patients are seen in the right place and that optometrists have access to hospital advice if they find someone with dry age-related changes, they can get an OCT transmitted instantly to a to, to hospital or to a or to a specially trained optometrist who can then confirm 
that this patient has dry age changes, that on balance they are visually impaired, and the optometrist is perfectly well qualified to, to give an opinion on that. Uh, and then that could lead to registration without ever coming near hospital at all. And that, I think, would go a long way to making sure more patients, number one, got the benefits they needed, and number two, that the, 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 da the central data collection was better and, more, and the statistics more accurate. It is an extraordinary silver lining to the cloud of COVID, isn't it? The changes that are happening in ophthalmology in lots of areas, but in ophthalmology, changes that were on the way but were going to take years are now happening in almost weeks, aren't they? It's quite an extraordinary rap rapidity, a rapid um, turnover of change that we're going through now. Well, the whole point is to drive access, access to, to give patients more access to timely care in, in an accessible, safe place. And COVID has, has probably for, brought those changes forward in five months, which would have taken five, five to 10 years. But it does need improved, improved, improved digital connectivity. It, 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 it needs more kit for optometrists to some extent, and it needs a better system-wide governance to ensure consistency of care throughout the community because it does need to be, to, be, to be managed well. But I think all the signs are that it has been managed well. I think the other benefit of um, COVID, so to speak, would be that up to March this year, there were, was minimal use of, of video consultations in ophthalmology. Um, and this has grown enormously in the last six months and will be permanent and it will not go away. A lot of patients have learned the benefits of being able to... to, to, to to log in and be and discuss their problems with an eye surgeon or an optometrist or a, an optomic nurse online. And suddenly in Moorfields, we now see about 300, three, 300 consultations a day uh, by video links from zero in early March of this year. So it has transformed care. And although it will probably drop back a bit as COVID recedes, it, it would still be, it, it's still a, a huge change for the future and I think it's going to stay. I think you're right and um, just uh, two very quick questions before we finish because we're nearly pretty out of time really but um, uh, glare so a question here about glare can you be registered as sight impaired if your vision your vision doesn't qualify but glare is so painful that it affects your life hugely? Uh, the short answer is yes it, it's um, what the patient would need to talk it through with their optometrist and their ophthalmologist to come to a a view as just how how impairing it was and that they were and making sure they were already getting all the help they could in particular some groups are particularly susceptible to glare i think patients who are visually impaired from albinism and that because they have very thin irises they, they just get too much light in their eyes and that they can be functionally blind in sunlight even with the best prescription glasses and all the usual common sense protection and that group are certainly registered as sight impaired if required and there are a range of related conditions that have similar problems so you're right glare and dazzle can 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 if they are if they are significant can qualify you for register for certification as sight impaired and, and somebody mentions that echoes are quite important in the uh, certification process referring on for, for that is quite true isn't it echoes often play <coughs> in identifying somebody who is ready for CVI? Echoes are a vital part of the system. They're, uh, they, they play a huge role in making sure that patients, number one, are identified who might benefit from, from certification, but then once they, are ready, once they have been certified, that they are then uh, facilitated to access the, the services that they, that they will benefit from. And... Uh, We've certainly used them, and most hospitals have one, and some have more than one. But it requires constant pressure to make sure that they are um, that that service is maintained. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got one uh, query which I'm not going to put put to you because I think it's uh, from somebody who describes themselves in no man's land and needs some advice on. Okay. EVI, but I'm going to put you in touch. You'll know who you are uh, submitting your question. I'm going to put you in touch with Colin, who will get you out of no man's land and um, gu guide you back through the barbed wire. So uh, I'll, I'll do 
do that directly. <laughs> we'll do that directly. Um, but we've run out of time. Um, uh, Colin, thank you very much indeed for being with us. And Declan, thank you very, very much indeed for giving up your precious evening to us this evening. I am so grateful to you. Um, please let us know um, uh, from the feedback uh, how tonight went. Um, let me tell you that the uh, virtual clinic next month in December, on the 8th of December, will be with Dr. Hannah Bartlett uh, from Aston University in Birmingham, who will be talking about nutrition and the eye. How important is diet in AMD and how important is dietary supplements in AMD? So uh, a controversial subject in some areas, and I know one that many, many people are interested in. So Hannah Bartlett is our guest next month. Thank you very much indeed for joining this evening. And Declan, to you, thank you very much again. I'm so, uh, so grateful to you for your time. Uh, have a good evening, everybody, and I'll see you next month. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.